Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Isabella Zaluska, and I'm the Gazette's local government reporter covering Iowa City and Johnson County. Today, I'll be moderating our discussion about child care. This session is part of the policy track and the diversity, equity, and inclusion track. Thank you to Inclusive ICR for sponsoring this session. A short video from our sponsor will show up on your screen right now. Hi friends, Angelica Veneta, co-chair of Inclusive ICR. We are a coalition of over 220 employers in Eastern Iowa, all working together to grow the diversity and inclusion of our workforce, to create a space where employees feel a sense of belonging, included, and valued. Inclusive ICR is a proud sponsor of the diversity, equity, and inclusion track of the Iowa Ideas Conference. As you participate today, be sure to connect with other Inclusive ICR champions as we'd love to share information with you about our upcoming coalition meetings, projects, and how our work is impacting positive social change in our region. Be sure to check out our website at inclusiveicr.org for upcoming events and our e-newsletter. Thank you and have a great conference. Thank you again to Inclusive ICR for sponsoring this track and the session. We have three really great panelists joining us today. We'll be talking about the impacts we've seen on childcare due to the COVID-19 pandemic and some steps that have been taken already to um, address these challenges. We'll also be talking about what still needs to be done, possible solutions and future steps to make childcare more accessible, affordable, and how to support staff and providers with the challenges they're facing. Before we start the discussion, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves by saying their name, organization, and descri describing their current role and involvement with child care. Um, Tracy, you're the first one on my screen. Would you be able to start us off? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Tracy Eller. I'm an early childhood educator and the state representative of Iowa House District 70. Um, and I'm involved in child care in multiple areas. I ran my own um, child development home for 14 years. Um, I'm a continuing ed instructor for the early ed workforce, um, the chair of the early childhood workforce advisory committee. And um, I could go on and on and on. But basically, I work with providers, children, um, and in the legislature trying to get some improvements for the child care system. Thanks, Tracy. Jenna? Good morning, everyone. My name is Jenna Ramsey. I am the Stanton Community Development Director, and my current role is working with our Stanton Child Resource Center Daycare Center to expand uh, and, and build a new daycare. And I'm also a mom with three kids at our current daycare. Thanks, Jenna and Ryan. Hi, I'm Ryan Page. I am uh, with the Department of Human Services in our policy division, uh, specifically the Child Care Bureau. I am primarily over the regulations of child care facilities, um, but as our team lead, I am heavily involved in kind of all aspects of child care operations in Iowa. Awesome. Thank you again for those introductions. And thank you for everyone joining us this morning. Just as a reminder, throughout the session, you can submit questions through the Whova chat, um, and we will be, do our best to get those answered and any questions that um, we don't have time for, feel free to connect with, with the panelists through the Whova feature as well. Um, but to start us off, I was hoping we could take a little bit of a step back and Ryan, if you could tell us more about the types of childcare in Iowa and what DHS has oversight of. Um, yeah, so we uh, have the licensed childcare centers. So those are our um, larger programs serving larger numbers of, of children. Um, that includes before and after school programs that are within school districts. That did not, um, that was not previously under DHS purview, but we've had oversight of those um, for the last five or six years. And then um, our child development homes, like Representative Ellert had mentioned, so that is when um, a person is caring for a certain number of children and register um, as a child development home with us, uh, having pre-inspections and annual inspections and professional development requirements. Um, and then we have um, childcare homes that are not required to be regulated by us um, that can legally operate in Iowa without a registration. So we have kind of two pockets of those. Um, part of them can take childcare assistance, which is um, the subsidy program for our low income families. 
those, uh, that group of, of providers have a, a little bit of oversight for minimum health and safety because they're receiving federal funding. Um, the other group, if they are private pay and they are not required to register, then um, they do not have any DHS oversight. And um, I was also hoping that each of you could talk a little bit more about what, what we saw regarding the state of childcare before the pandemic, um, talking a little bit more about what were the challenges before the pandemic, what was being done to address those challenges, um, and kind of what was, what was that current state before 2020? Um, I'll start, I guess. <laughs> um, I think it's also important to take a step even a little bit further back to uh, 2014 to 2016. This is when we had a federal reauthorization of, a, of a, the Child Care and Development Block Grant. So we did see a shift in what child care looked like even over those couple of years because we had an increase in regulatory requirements, professional development requirements, and inspection requirements. So we did see a decrease in certain um, populations of our child care workforce. Um, then entering in now, child development homes at both the state and the national level, um, are we are seeing a decline in those. In Iowa, um, our licensed child care centers remain fairly consistent around 1,500 um, across the state pre or right at the peak of COVID, um, we had 65% closure rate of our licensed child care centers. Now we're at about a 2%, which is kind of a natural ebb and flow that takes place um, in that population. And Tracy, Jenna, anything you want to add about your work um, and what you saw before the pandemic? I'll go. Um, I appreciate that Ryan gave the background um, on the federal reauth because that certainly did come into play. Um, and then we've steadily, a lot of what I'll speak to will be here um, in Lynn County. Um, our numbers have steadily within the past five years been decreasing as far as the um, programs that we have lost and then COVID. And then here in Lynn County, we had the Duray Show also, which also um, contributed to our loss of programs. So what we're seeing now is definitely not a new issue. Um, it's just getting a lot more attention because we're in the middle of a pandemic. And here in Lynn County and 20 some other counties across the state, they also have the natural disaster. So um, that's a good slash bad thing. It's you know good that we're finally in the spotlight. Um, bad that it took a pandemic and natural disaster to get us in the spotlight because these are not new issues um, and they're certainly getting worse. But I think people really realize we need help now. <laughs> and and I second that. Um, I've heard some people say you know that childcare is in the spotlight now and it's getting better and it is, but there's still a shortage. Um, Pre-pandemic, we uh, were, were fundraising for a new daycare and daycare expansion because of the need for child care in our county. Uh, we have had another daycare in our county open, which has helped, but we still have a wait list. The wait list and the need for daycare has not changed, and it's really greater than ever. Yeah, I think it's definitely important to, to mention that these are not new issues and these are not new challenges. And um, as we've seen with other issues, too, the pandemic has exacerbated and added on to these challenges. Um, something that I was wondering about kind of to put these challenges into context are, um, is what we're seeing right now due to the pandemic piling on to, or the, sa the same challenges that we saw before the pandemic, or are they different challenges, but adding on to what we already saw? I would say a lot of them are the same, they're just intensified due to the pandemic. Um, but then you do have a few issues that I think um, are a result of the pandemic. Like I'm still hearing programs say they're having a hard time getting certain supplies or they're having to change their menus. And I see that even I work in the school district also. And almost daily we're seeing our menus change because what they planned, they can't get a hold of now. So um, I think things like that are a result of the pandemic and just a shortage on items or it's taking longer to get things. 
And, you know, when you need gloves or your sanitation supplies, that is a big issue for programs. But as far as um, everything else, it's just getting worse. Yeah. And then um, I, I agree with that. Uh, supply chain issues are, are just um, something that we are experiencing all over the place. Um, the other piece is workforce shortage. Um, I think that 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 existed before as well, but it is extremely apparent now as parents are trying to access childcare and can't find it. So we often do, um, anecdotally, I, I can say we have programs that have slot availability, but they can't fill those slots because they don't have the staffing. Um, and again, this is a, a state issue for childcare. It's a national issue for childcare, but we're seeing this in a lot of other sectors as well. And I would second that. I know on our level in our community at the, at the daycare, we would have people hired and then maybe they would, um, you know, they would go home and do the math, what they were getting for unemployment or anything else or for different reasons. And then they may not show up when they're supposed to start that day as they realize they're going to make more doing nothing or doing something else. So workforce shortage is huge. Another way the pand pandemic has changed what we looked at, at what we are looking at as our daycare expansion is we actually changed, um, changed the building that we're, um, that we're fundraising for to make it more pandemic friendly. And I know that that sounds kind of dramatic and crazy, but you never know what's going to happen in the future. And based on different things that happened in our facility, being a mom um, in, in the current daycare, we, we shifted kind of um, different things, the layout and different things that we did in the building because of the pandemic. Yeah, Jenna, can you talk a little bit more about um, some of those shifts and changes to make the building more pandemic friendly? Yes. Um, one of them is we, uh, we put big windows um, where the walls are. And I know that sounds silly, but the current building that we're in was actually an old steakhouse. And so you could go in and you could see, but um, one of the things that changed is when you, when the pandemic started as a mom, you weren't allowed to bring your, your child all the way to the room. You know, if it was on one end of the building or the other, you, you just brought them in and gave them a hug. And, and here you could actually, um, if something, you know, we're, we're prepared if something happened again, you could walk down the hall, you could sit there, you could watch, watch your kids play. I mean, so one is um, more visually friendly, I would say. Another one is that we actually divided the classrooms and made them smaller so we could have the same amount of kids, but smaller groups of kids together if there was an outbreak or a problem. Um, that is a big one. We actually created a health room. Um, so if there was, um, you know, some a child that isn't feeling well or has symptoms or something, um, they could go and, and hang out in that room. Um, they may be, currently they may be separated from those kids, but they wouldn't have their own space, you know, with a, um, with a provider or someone to help them. And then there's also a, a wellness area where when you come in, um, it's actually a place to uh, check the child's temperature and have everything right in the spot. Um, and you, could, they, you walk in, they step to the parents and children step to the side, they can take the temperature. So if other people need to get in and out of the door, they can. It's just a lot more friendly with all of the things that came up with COVID. Mm -hmm. Going back to that workforce piece, that was definitely something that I wanted to ask you all about um, you we've talked we've started talking about this a little bit but what are we seeing in, in terms of workforce challenges in this profession specifically um, and then as a follow-up what steps need to be taken to support staff and retain staff <laughs> none of us really know who to go for <laughs> um, yeah so with workforce uh, you know we're seeing fast food restaurants, um, other, other sectors that are offering starting pays of 12, 13, $14 an hour, um, which a lot of childcare facilities operating on a small profit margin, if, if one at all, uh, does not have the ability to, to fight that. So if they're paying 10 or $11, um, they can't compete with some of those higher wages that are offered. Families are also on average paying around 13% of income for childcare, um, which is similar to a, a four-year college tuition. And the uh, benchmark for affordability is 7%. 
So we already have families paying a lot of money for access to child care. And of course, that multiplies if you have more than one child in child care at the same time. And so it's really hard to raise rates on families. Um, so then it's hard to uh, increase your wages. And so there, it doesn't work uh, the, sim- the same way that a typical supply and demand um, occupation and wages would work. And that's really the part that I think the general public doesn't understand. I know when we went back for special session last week or the week before, and I was talking to some of my colleagues and I'm like, what, what are we going to start doing to work on this issue? And it was, well, those programs are just going to have to charge the parents more. That's not an option. Like we can't, that can't be the answer. We've got to look at other things um, because yeah, like Ryan said, they're starting, you know, above the, um, what child cares pay. I know here locally, we, you know, you can go to target for $15 an hour, get your store discount. They're paying for college. Now um, you probably have some paid holidays and you go home at the end of the day, not mentally um, and physically exhausted, most likely like you do in child care. So a lot less wear and tear on your body and your mind. And um, it just, I think with the pandemic too, that part really comes into play too. You know, this is a physically demanding job. It's a mentally, emotionally demanding job. And people are drained right now with the pandemic. Um, Still, like I'm still fixing my house, (laughs) Um, things like that. And if you can just go somewhere else with less demands and make more, it's a lot more appealing to providers right now. I agree with all of that. I I have told um, all of the daycare staff continually every day when I pick up my kids that they are saints and they're definitely not doing it for the money. They're doing it for the passion. So if there are, they have ideas or ways that we can help them to, to please let us know. Yeah. So going off of that, um, you know, it seems like raising the price of childcare really would not, you know, wouldn't address this problem because it is already so expensive and that wouldn't address the accessibility issue. So what are potential solutions to support staff while also making it more accessible or and easier on parents? Does that, um, is there something that could be done on the state level? Is that a policy question? Um, help us understand kind of what potential solutions are out there. I would personally like to see um, early ed and including child care receiving um, part of the budget, state budget every year, you know, like our public school system. It's got to be permanently in there, not just some years, you know, we're going to give this area of early ed some money and some years we're going to give this, um, we're going to continue to fund it and we can look for funding sources to help subsidize that care for families different from what we're already doing. I agree, another thing that we keep looking at uh, is benefits. Is there a way to partner and have shared models with other groups um, to provide benefits? We all know how important health insurance and everything is to families now. So what are some some other things besides raising the wage that we can do to help them? Yeah, the shared services. Thank you for bringing that up, Jenna. Actually, Ryan, wasn't it you and I a few years ago at that AFCC conference? We sat in on a really good session about shared services. And I don't know if you remember what state it was, Ryan, but they had an amazing model. And I would love to see something like that here. I think it would be a big benefit. Yeah, and I think there's, you know, a lot of different types of solutions um, to kind of blend together. So the shared services idea, looking, um, you know, ongoing, looking at our market rate surveys and our child care assistant rate structure, um, infusing funding into the wages program, uh, which is a salary supplement program um, for eligible individuals. And then, um, you know, looking at, at, you know, ratios and regulations and, and what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. And so always kind of staying on top of all sorts of different things that are taking place. Um, You know, benefits, that's a huge piece. Um, And whether or not we can stabilize workforce based off of just access to health insurance and things like that. So um, lots of different opportunities for um, the state and uh, federal level to to be looking at. 
Mm-hmm. And I think and even it- local level, I think mm-hmm. of like the Johnson County area, um, and they've done a lot in their area to um, work on different things locally with childcare and preschool. And so sometimes, you know, it's those public private partnerships and such. Um, ideally, you know, it'd be a statewide model so we can help throughout the state, but sometimes those small steps are what we need and we've got to look locally, like what can we do to at least help this area and this area and keep, you know, keep moving forward. Well, and there is, um, there's something to say about business engagement and uh, building partnerships to access childcare for their employees. So one -hmm. thing particularly that I hear about, um, especially in rural communities or are places that have factories that maybe run a second or third shift and the lack of access to um, childcare in those communities. So it doesn't always have to look like a big childcare center being stood up in a, in a community. It could be that we get two or three child development homes uh, that are offering up a service that could meet the need of some of those smaller spaces. So it's really important for communities to understand and do feasibility studies to say, what do we need? What type of child care? What ages do we need child care for? Um, and do we have the staff to support that rather than just kind of, if you build it, they will come because that doesn't always work. Yeah, yeah definitely. There are a lot of really good points raised up there. I, I want to go back to that discussion about child care for second and third shift workers. Um, how do we how do we support these families? What can be implemented moving forward to better support these families? Ryan, you had mentioned a possible solution of businesses getting more involved in offering that childcare. Um, but what else, what else is out there as something that Iowa could look at implementing? I personally, so I, Ryan gave some great ideas, you know, looking within your community first to see what's needed. And, you know, again, it's not, we don't always look, need to look at building new programs because some areas, I think, again, of Lynn County, we are, we have a lot of existing centers that can't even fully take their capacity because they can't fully staff. So we don't necessarily need new programs, but looking at what we, you have in your area, and maybe it's not a new center, it's, you know, those homes that might be willing to open for second or third shift. Um, also a lot of those second and third shift jobs, those families are on childcare assistance. I know here in Lynn County, we had, it's actually a friend of mine that opened up a program that was supposed to be intended to be a 24 hour a day program. She hasn't went to second or third shift because she doesn't at this time accept childcare assistance. And that's all that she gets calls for. So that's again, of so many of these issues within childcare are interwoven with other issues. You might have people willing But then do they take the pay, you know, the type of pay that these um, families are going to pay with? And until we address more on the child care assistance side, some of these programs might not be willing to do that either. Um, But I know quite a few years ago, my own program got paid through a local grant. And I can't think at this time what it was. It was so long ago. But to hold X amount of spots just to be used specifically for a certain age group and um, certain demographic. And then you just got paid to hold those. And, and they might've been filled you know, at some point in time, but by who they were supposed to be filled for. So maybe you don't need a whole program, but your you know, company's gonna pay a provider to keep X amount of slots for their employee open, um, but they've gotta be compensated. We just need to really look locally um, at what's going on, look at that child care assistance reimbursement rate um, and the absences. <laughs> I really liked that unlimited absences. We need to continue with that. And um, yeah, just a variety of different things. It's not going to be a one size fits all approach, um, especially when you compare the rural, rural and urban areas they are going to look quite different too. Yeah, I think it's important to mention too. Um, and I think we will we'll get to this, but you know, the governor uh, recognized that child care is an issue. And so uh, we had a task force um, that was initiated and we are waiting for the uh, final report on what those formal recommendations are. But, you know, that was an opportunity for a lot of different people to come together and put their heads together and start going, okay, we, we recognize how complicated child care is and how interwoven it is into so many other spaces that, um, 
there is no one size fits all approach. It's so multifaceted. So looking forward to seeing, um, you know, those formal recommendations coming out as some of those, the recommendations may be to, you know, con continue or modify things that we've done during the pandemic to help stabilize and maintain the existing infrastructure that we do have. And um, Jenna, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what you've seen in Stanton in terms of that demand for childcare. You had touched on it a little bit already during our conversation, but could you tell us a little bit more about kind of what you're seeing from both parents and staff? Yes. Um you know, really pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, like I said, there, there's still a wait list and there's still a need for childcare. We are very lucky in Stanton. We've had um, quality childcare since 2005. And I can't tell you how many years, but we've had a, a five-star five star daycare. Um, we still have, have a wait list. You know, I think people kind of maybe wondered a little bit once the pandemic hit, you know, will it be as big? Will people keep their kids home? You know, what, what will happen? But um, we still have a wait list. Uh, child care has been a big issue in Montgomery County. We have had another daycare open nearby, but we still have a wait list. So it is um, still a need. One of the challenges that we're seeing right now um, is as we are fundraising locally and working on um, private and, and business donations for it is um, one, a lot of the funds out there um, that that came from the pandemic are great and we've been able to use them for our current facility. Um, they don't necessarily go toward new construction. So that's one of the challenges is finding um, grants and funding out there for new construction. And then another challenge um, that we've seen is a, a lot of the funds that are out there um, are based on low to moderate income. And we are, I wanna say blessed, we are lucky that we our low to moderate income is not as high as maybe some other rural communities. So we have not been able to take advantage of any of those funds either. So those are really two of our current challenges that we have um, as we are working to, um, to fill a need for needing, still needing daycare in Southwest Iowa. Currently the Stanton Child Resource Center covers five counties. Yeah, and going back to some of those, going back to that conversation about the pandemic, what kinds of shifts have we seen um, as people are returning to work or are continuing to work from home, um, what kind of impact has that had on, on parents and providers? I think it just has caused a lot of um, unknowns. I know I, so ever since I went back, since I went to the legislature, my program was a summer only program because I'm gone, you know, four to five months out of the year in Des Moines. So I was no longer a full time program. But the, when COVID started, that was around March and we got sent home from the legislature. So I opened my program back up in March rather than um, June. And right away, I had all these parents contact me saying, you know, school's out, preschool's closed. We need you to open early. So I was ready to be fully, you know, full um, with kids. And then I, it took me two weeks to get everything ready to open back up. And then I had three parents because everybody was either like temporarily furloughed or um, their businesses didn't know what they were going to do with them or they could work from home. And the families are like, well, we don't want to pay for childcare if we're working from home. So I had three children. Um, I can take 12 with my registration category. And I think it was about two months. And then families were either like, can't do this with the kids at home. We need to send them somewhere. So some came back part-time. Um, and then it wasn't till probably July, maybe I got full again um, because people were either going back to work or their um, employer said, you know, we need you to be available and, you know, on your screen, these hours, please don't have your kids in the background and stuff. And so they had to, you know, go back to work without the kids around. And then it kind of, you would see it kind of dip back and forth again, but nobody wanted to give up their slot because they knew at some point, mm -hmm. well, we're going to need it back. So then you have to have the discussion like, well, if I'm holding it for you, you're going to have to pay for it. Some programs don't do that. Some charge, you know, a prorated rate. Um, and then you might have that family come back and say, okay, we decided we aren't going to need this slot anymore. We are going to try to make it work, um, working at home with our children there. And so our numbers were just going up and down, up and down. 
And it was really hard. And then I think at least in here in the area, the providers I network with, it seemed to stabilize for a little bit and everyone kind of filled back up. And then as employers kind of figured out what they were going to do, some decided they weren't going back to physical buildings and they were just going to set all their employees up with home offices or, you know, it just depended on the different situations. But now I'm hearing from a lot of providers, they're kind of going through that again as families are trying to figure out what they're going to do for work or if they really need childcare full time. They need it. Most of them need it. It's just they can't provide a steady schedule. And then that makes it hard on the programs too. You just don't, don't know. I agree with you. That's what, one thing I was going to add in as a mom. And I know it's happened at our local daycare is, is dropping, um, you know, being the amount of parents at calling to see, Hey, do you have a space free today from nine to 11 or something like that? Because um, like in my situation, some things are zoom and then, Oh, maybe we could have a regular meeting or vice versa, you know? And um, if, if I'm at home on zoom, I, I try to keep my kids, you know, at here and um, things like that. So drop-ins and having that potential availability at our local daycare has really, um, has really been a challenge. And I'll add to that, the drop-ins, I don't know about you, Jenna, I'm assuming it's the same. It creates a lot of extra work for the providers and programs too, yeah. because whether that child comes one time for a drop-in or maybe they're going to come every few weeks, or maybe they will be a regular kid for a while and then a drop-in. They still require all the same paperwork. So you still got to gather all of that, get a file on them, you know, still, you know, uh, maybe possibly change your meal counts for the day. So it adds a lot of extra work for the providers and sometimes funding, you know, to have paid people to have time to do all that stuff when you don't know who's coming every day on a steady basis. Yeah. And, you know, I think uh, you've outlined a lot of ways that the market has had some volatility over the last couple of years. Um, you know, a couple of things that we did immediately early on is we we didn't know what things were going to look like. We didn't know our families going to have this immediate need for access to child care because they're, the kids aren't in school or are they going to kind of shut down? And so uh, we really asked programs, if you have the ability to stay open and serve our essential workers, please do so. And then worked to, you know, pr- worked with Department of Public Health to outline, um, health, you know, health and safety guidance to do it as safely as possible. And then started infusing some of those funding. So rejuvenation grants, if programs had to close and then reopen, we could help them pay for a deep cleaning or um, replenishment of supplies or things like that. And then, um, you know, additional stipends or unlimited absent days, as um, Tracy had mentioned, so that because we knew that that funding was not um, necessarily consistent and we didn't really know what things were going to look like. So infusing funding as quickly as we could and then looking at, especially for our child development homes, some of our regulations around part-time hours or how many hours a school ager can be present, we um, eased up on some of that to say, nope, you can take them, (laughs) you know, please make sure that children have a safe place to be uh, during this time, so. And a question from our audience is, are we seeing any impact on childcare affordability from the expanded child tax credit? Tracy, do you know? Uh, So the tax credits get tricky for me. because, and I guess, I don't know if they're referring to um, the monthly one that people are getting right now, or, you know, the tax credits when you file your taxes. So the ones when you file your taxes, I feel like families need that money in hand now to address the affordability issue. Waiting until tax time when you may or may not even get a refund, because sometimes that tax credit just helps offset other stuff that you would have had to pay, doesn't always help. Or I think back to when I was a single mom on childcare assistance and, you know, I got some of those tax credits, but I was defaulting on my student loan. So I didn't get to get that tax credit. You know, the student loan companies would take it. So they aren't always getting that. And when I think about addressing the affordability issue, those parents need money in hand now. So there is that monthly um, uh, credit going out. Some families chose to accept it. Some families did not. So it's really hard to say 
if it's helping um, because some were worried about it uh, messing up their taxes. You know, they don't know if they're going to make the same amount this year or not um, because it's basically, you know, up front, you know, you get it up front instead of at tax time. So um, it's really hard to say if it's helping or not. And are they using that towards childcare or are they using that to get caught up on rent, utilities, pay for food? You know, I, I think that's a really hard question to answer. There's definitely, I think it's good that we have those options. I don't know that they really help as much as they're intended to. Brian, and you had touched on this a little bit, but earlier this year, Governor Reynolds launched the Child Care Task Force. Um, you had mentioned that we're, we're kind of waiting to see the results from that. Um, would one of you be able to talk a little bit more about that task force and, um, you know, just to catch people up who might not be familiar with it? Um, yeah, so there's not a whole lot, I guess, to go into with detail, um, but through Future Ready Iowa um, and Iowa Workforce Development, the task force was initiated, um, I think it was back in March, and then it was a hundred day sprint. So there was a lot of work that went into looking at child care assistance, looking at regulations, looking at tax credits, looking at um, business models, looking at public private partnerships, looking at um, different incentives. And, you know, we, there were a couple different focus groups uh, that were held virtually, one for child care providers to talk about their experiences, one for families that are trying to access child care, um, you know, particularly raising awareness to the fact that some families on CCA can't find it because of, of rates or children with special needs um, may not have um, access to quality affordable child care or those second and third shifts. And so looking at some of the non-traditional services that are needed um, across the state. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, we're waiting for the final report. There's gonna be lots of recommendations, um, some small, some big, some immediate um, things that we can do, some that will take legislative action. So, you know, it's, it's all over um, with the different types of solutions that are available to us. And you can go, I have the um, working group priority recommendations. So these aren't finalized, but you can go on the Future Ready Iowa site and see some of the things that they're considering that might make it into that report. There's 14 things on the list right now. Um, and Jenna, I believe that you were part of that task force, if I'm correct. Could you talk a little bit more about your involvement and um, kind of that discussion? Yes, um, I, I was on that. It was definitely, like Brian said, a sprint marathon, but there were some different focus groups. Um, one thing I was really impressed with is that they did have those virtual sessions. Um, you know, it was really a public thing, um, you know, getting public feedback um, from different people and then having different town hall meetings and whatnot to get feedback and ideas. And those were talked about, you know, in those focus groups and and, and overall. And we did finish that up in July. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what comes of that. Um, and just as a reminder to our audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit those. Um, and another thing that I was hoping that we could talk a little bit about was the Iowa legislature passed three bills addressing child care. Could we start by talking through those pieces of legislation and what they are addressing? Representative Ellert. <laughs> <laughs> so I did not write down the bill numbers and those are really hard for me to memorize because you know it starts with one number and they change. Um, the first one though that I can think of is um, we changed the number of children that a non-registered child care program can take. They can now accept one additional child that is school-aged. Um, I personally was not in support of that one because the intention of that bill was to help provide more access because we are so short on slots. Well, if you look at... Um, who like childcare resource and referral most likely gets calls for, it's that infant toddler age group. Um, and we didn't do anything to address that. We are saying you can now take an extra school age child. 
We absolutely need more help on wraparound care and before and after school programs. But I don't, at least in my area, see those in the in-homes as much. You will see the school-age kids in the summertime when they're there full-time, but so many of our providers don't have the ability to transport those children to and from school. So you usually typically see those programs at a school site or at a center that transports. Um, so I just didn't feel that it was helping very much. And then you have the fact that we're now allowing these non-registered programs that do not have to meet all the same programs requirements as our licensed and registered, given the opportunity to make more income now by adding an additional child. Um, and we're not giving that opportunity to our wonderful registered and um, licensed programs that have been working through the pandemic, working through the natural disaster, um, that are, you know, struggling and scrambling for income right now. And then you also have them taking almost as many children now as some of our registration categories but they don't have all the minimum health and safety standards to follow. So I was hesitant to, to allow them to take more when they don't have to, the health and safety standards to follow. Um, it just, we're, we're creating a very fine line now between that registered and non-registered. And there's a lot of differences between them. Not that there aren't some wonderful non-registered programs. Um, I like to refer to the programs that I'm really thinking of is the illegally operating ones, the ones that aren't following um, any type of health and safety. They aren't following the ratios that they're supposed to um, because we do have good non-registered programs. But I just felt like we were catering to the non-registered and it's a slippery slope then to um, start looking into some health and safety regulations that, um, that you know someone might wanna mess with that we need to keep. And I didn't think it really solved anything. Now, if they were gonna say you could take an extra infant or toddler, I could have maybe been on board because I feel that would have really addressed um, some of the accessibility issues. Yeah, so specifically related to that one, um, we, you know, as we mentioned in that non-registered or unregulated uh, space, we have the ones that take child care assistance and the ones that do not. If they do not, then DHS does not have any legal oversight over that group at all. Um, so there are no minimum health and safety standards. The ones that take child care assistance, we do have those minimum health and safety requirements. Um, I don't have any information at this time to say, oh, now we've like got more uh, non-registered providers that are that are serving more kids. Um, it's only been a few months. So we don't have any data to say that that has made an impact on the child care assistance program specifically. And ever since the reauthorization at the federal level, those numbers of that non-registered group have become very, very small. So when we have the unregulated, we don't know who they are. We don't know where they are operating because they are not required to register with us and because we have no oversight. So how that's impacting um, the state overall by allowing that additional child is, is also going to be really hard to measure. Yeah, and um, kind of going back to those numbers and that discussion between regulated and unregulated, um, it's been reported that Iowa has lost a third of its child care programs in the last five years. Could, could we talk a little bit more about that and make sense of that number um, and kind of where it falls into the conversation that we're having? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. Um, so that non-registered group, that so we call them like our CCA paid um, that is where we saw the hugest decline of providers. That, so when you talk about 33%, the majority was there. Um, our child development homes, we have seen a reduction, um, 150 maybe across the state or 200 um, in the last few years. But we also see kind of an ebb and flow. So that's kind of a generalized number. Um, but again, that's a national trend. Childcare centers, very stable anywhere between, you know, 1500 and, and 1520. There's always kind of this space, one closes, one opens. Um, the slot capacity in our child care centers has remained pretty stable, um, even increasing some slot capacity, uh, which kind of offsets some of the loss of child development homes. I think where, the, where we're impacted when we lose those child development homes are those tend to be in those smaller communities that once they're down, then there really is a struggle to access. So we talk about childcare deserts and availability. 
And so when we lose those child development homes, that's where those deserts really kind of start to pop up a little bit more apparently um, because you have to drive to get to the centers that have the slots. And then when you don't have staffing um, to fill your slots, <laughs> then again, it, it just exacerbates the problem. Mm -hmm. And um, and that, so we've talked about some of the challenges and some of potential solutions, but I also wanted to ask all three of you what you know what is the ideal state of childcare? How do we get to that state? Um, it's a broad question, but I think as we're talking about this discussion and how to address some of these challenges, um, you know what what is what does that ideal state look like? Well, I, if it's okay if I start on this one, only because I sit on a committee through the Iowa Association for the Education of Young Children, and we have this nice little um, vision for a stable early care and education workforce in Iowa, and we sent in um, three recommendations, and um, those recommendations, not, I don't know, you know, if we'll get there or anything, but these are the recommendations. Increasing funding to adequately support and sustain statewide child care wages, Iowa, and teach early childhood Iowa, which would be huge. We saw that big investment, and that was one of the other things that went through this year in the legislature, but it was a one-time pot of funding. We need to keep that going. Um, name early care and education a high-demand occupation through the state of Iowa and implement a salary scale for ECE tied to professional levels identified in NACI, which is the National Association for the Education of Children, the um, unifying framework for the um, early childhood education workforce. And that's an initiative powered to the profession that's been going on for quite some time now. Um, that I think that one there is a big one that really needs to happen, professionalizing the workforce um, so that Childcare is looked at as a profession and a professional profession. We are not babysitters. Um, you know, I think about myself, I have an undergrad and graduate in early childhood education. I ran an in-home program. Doesn't mean I'm a babysitter, you know, plopping these kids in front of a TV. We are doing play-based learning, getting these kids ready for school, working on social emotional learning. And that's what you're going to see in a lot of these registered and licensed programs. Um, so when community and, you know, um, individuals think of childcare as a profession and that we're professionals, that's going to be a big thing. And I think some of these other things will fall into place. As a mom and community development director, um, I, I'm really passionate about, we are very fortunate in Stanton to have the five, our five-star daycare. And I, I, I would say the, my, my overall goal is um, to find a sustainable model for affordable and quality childcare which we have found in Stanton. We're very lucky. So the question is, our goal is how do we, um, how do we keep those employees and make it more advantageous and advantageous for employees to join our team? And how do we expand it and make this available for even more families throughout our um, Southwest Iowa area? Yeah, I think um, Jenna and Tracy kind of hit the nail on the head there. I think um, it being such a big conversation right now is, is hugely important. And I think we need to keep it up front. And so the, uh, child care are, we know that economically, we do not work as good as we could if we don't have access to child care. But then we also need to be thinking about kind of that secondary piece of we are also raising our future workforce and we're looking at the importance of brain development between zero and five. And we're looking at not just access to child care and warm body supervision, but quality child care and safe child care and making sure that we are talking about both of those things because warm body supervision isn't enough when we start thinking about, um, you know, our future generations and how we keep our economy going. So today's economy and tomorrow's economy. And that's the piece. Thank you for bringing that up, Ryan, because that's a piece that I feel like we're really missing. Um, when I first started advocating for a lot of the things I'm still advocating now for in the legislature, but this was years ago when um, being in the legislature wasn't even a thought, that was the big conversation is brain development. You know, before children even hits that kindergarten classroom, their brains almost fully developed. So what happens in those early care and education settings is so important and sets them up for success later on in life. And that was what we were going to legislators and businesses and everything and advocating for, you know, sharing all this 
brain development information, which should be one of the most important pieces because we're, we're talking about what's good for children. And then we weren't really getting any bites. Like no one really seemed interested when we turned it around to the business economy workforce conversation. That's when people started listening and it's definitely an economic conversation. It does, you know, affect the workforce, but I just am really sad that that child piece is getting lost and everyone's just concerned about, you know, how can we get people to work and get, um, you know, these children cared for because they're not taking that other piece into consideration. And like Ryan said, it can't just be these warm bodies. Again, we're not babysitters. We are professionals. We have a set of standards to follow. We have training to follow. We've got health and safety, you know, standards. That's part of the reason we got to stay open during the pandemic. We are prepared for this. We have the training for it. Um, and we just, I just don't want people to lose that part that we are doing this, not just for the economy and workforce, we have to be doing this for the children and what's good for them also. You know, one thing I want to point out is that Jenna mentioned is all of the different things that they're doing with their expansion opportunity based off of the pandemic, right? So they're going, we're doing this differently with classroom sizes, with walls, we're having a, um, a six space that is a little bit different. Um, with the federal reauthorization, one of the big changes was around emergency preparedness. And so there were all these plans that child care providers needed to um, stand up. So that looked like lockdown, shelter in place, evacuation. Guess what wasn't on the list? A pandemic. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, we're so we're continuing to learn, continuing to to evaluate things. But what Jenna's describing is professionalizing their space even more so in a different way based off of our own experiences. So when we when we have a provider that experiences a derecho or another type of natural disaster, they're able to go, wow, okay, I can plan for that differently and I can assure safety better and in a different way or this worked really great, I don't need to change anything. But those are the kinds of things we're talking about, professionalizing is minimum health and safety and professional development and ongoing education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and going off of that, going back to the work that Jenna, you're doing in Stanton, do you think that um, you know the work that you're doing, this, the daycare center um, and the work that's being done there, do you think that could serve as a model for other communities? Yes, I do. Um, we've, we've already been very fortunate in the funds that we've received from partnerships. We know a lot of this is, is uh, um, a lot of things that, that work are for, with great partners. So we've been able to receive some different funding and we're still working with some of our local partners. Um, I think anything is a great model if there's a lot of partners in it to show how it can get done. Um, I was also wondering if there are any, you know, where can people go for more information or resources? Um, you know, any, any new newsletters, websites that you all want to plug to, you know, for people to get involved in this conversation and also, um, you know, if they're looking for child care or want more information. Looking for child care or wanting um, a lot of different resources about child care. I would say Iowa CCRNR, so the Iowa Child Care Resource and Referral page is a wonderful one to follow, and they can get online child care referrals, or it gives them the number to contact with um, a CCRNR specialist that can help them pinpoint more locations in their area that might have openings. Um, Iowa AYC, the Iowa Association for the Education of Young Children, is going to have a lot of good information. Um, Common Good Iowa, they'll have more of the policy pieces on there. So people can stay up to date with what is passing, what is being advocated for, what's being looked at. They're really active during session. And then um, as far as like different plans around what communities can use, the Iowa Women's Foundation has an amazing um, toolkit because they go around the state and work with different communities and put together a toolkit of what each community is doing to work and address their childcare um, shortages or whatever the issues might be there. So then maybe if another area has that same problem, they can borrow that model and use that. So those would be my recommendations. Yeah. And then um, in addition to that, uh, Iowa DHS also has our um, page with child care resources and information. Particularly, we do have a search portal where you go to find child care. 
Um, and you can get kind of a map and a list and you can cater it down a little bit. So we can't tell you if there's necessarily openings um, at those locations, but we can tell you what types of programs are available in your community. CCRNR is going to be able to provide a little bit more um, drill down about some of those providers. On our website, we also put our child care compliance and complaint reports out there for families to review. So if a family identifies um, a provider that they are interested in, they can go back and look at what it looked like at our last annual inspection, or if we've had complaint violations and what that looked like. So families can be informed about the, the providers that they're choosing. Those annual inspection reports also identify if that uh, provider is on our quality rating system and whether or not they're voluntarily um, participating in a system that increases their quality. And I, I um, we've definitely been partnering and working with all of the um, groups that you guys have mentioned. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Tracy and the legislature and Ryan and DHS, because I, I, I know I've talked with Ryan about different um, programs and things. It's a great resource. And I feel like sometimes, um, you know, things like that may get a bad rap and they are actually a voice and they're helping us and they're moving forward with childcare. So th thank you to you guys for being a great resource to everyone in the state of Iowa. And talking about uh, those resources, what about for families who are low, low income or where can they get more information or what is available to them um, to, you know, to access childcare? Yep. So we have our child care assistance application um, that is available through either the DHS website or um, there's the phone information listed. CCRNR also has that information on hand. Um, but basically, there's an application process for families, and if they meet um, eligibility requirements financially and as a need for service, then they can be approved for child care assistance and, and access a child care provider that has that agreement with us to serve them. Yeah, we have um, just a couple more minutes of our discussion, and I wanted to ask each of you if there's, you know, any final thoughts, anything that you want to leave the attendees thinking about, or um, just kind of anything, any last, um, any last messages as we're wrapping up. Um, I think, go ahead, Tracy. Oh, I was just going to say that this is really a conversation that I think involves everyone. Some people, I don't think they see, you know, how, why does this matter to me or don't understand how they can get involved. And this really is going to take community effort. Um, we might have, maybe there's people that can identify spaces that could be used that they didn't think about. Um, you know, you're definitely, your business businesses can partner to work on funding. And I've heard in different areas um, as I go around even different states, um, sometimes a business will decide to pay for half of the um, staff salary in a child care if they designate, you know, so many slots for employees. That's, I was thinking about that earlier after I talked earlier. Um, that's even another way to increase income partnering with people, building those relationships. Um, it's not always going to be coming directly from the child care workforce because they are so busy taking care of children, you know, sanitizing, disinfecting, trying to keep their programs going right now. They've got a lot of work. We need the communities to help them. And there really is a place where everybody can help um, get involved, see what's going on in the community, where you can maybe be an asset um, and talking to your local child care providers. Yeah, you know, I'm, a, I'm kind of big on um, historical perspective. And, and so I've been in this position for eight years now. And uh, while we have so much work to do, right, there's there's all sorts of things that we can improve. I've been able to watch us move forward very quickly in the quality of service that is being provided in Iowa and some of the really cool things that we've been able to stand up. And so um, kind of pre-federal reauthorization, um, during, post, now kind of in this pandemic phase, um, still being able to see really amazing things happening in local communities and partnerships and a standing up of programs. And um, it's just been, it has just been an honor to participate and be part of those experiences because Iowa really has come very, very far 
um, in the last decade when it comes to what childcare looks like, uh, even from a minimum health and safety perspective. And I always remind people um, to to don't don't forget your community. I know that sounds silly, but especially you know um, childcare providers. They have so many things going on, even right now, it hasn't changed. They still have to, you know, lots of cleaning duties every day and, and um, whatnot. And there's a lot of people and groups and businesses in our community that are helping our, our child care center succeed. And um, the being in being the, the daycare, being a part of the community and the community helping the daycare is really uh, has really helped us succeed. So reach out to everyone in your community. Um, Jenna, Tracy, and Ryan, thank you so much for being part of the discussion today and being part of the Iowa Ideas Conference. Uh, for our attendees, the next session is our closing keynote with Peggy Whitson. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us this morning. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.